let's face it, in today's world, with all of the crazy stuff happening in the news, trying to keep a balance between your work life, your personal life, friends, family, it can feel like things are spinning out of control. So what we're going to get into talking about today is, A, how do you manage your, and navigate your way through that? And then B, within all of that, how do you find that spark or what we're calling your life's purpose? Because your life's purpose, once you do figure that out and start on that journey, it gives you such a focus, points you in such a specific direction that all of this chaos in the world kind of melts away to the background a little bit. So that's kind of the silver bullet that we want to get into talking about today. So stick around. Let's get into it. Well, hello, gang. How are you doing this morning? Welcome, Erica. Welcome, Edward. Let's dive right in. I want to ask each of you this question. So what was it about today's topic? you know, igniting your spark and then just kind of figuring out what your passion is. What was it about that topic that was most important to you? Sometimes we all just forget about why we really started on a particular mission or why we were excited about a relationship or a new job and or just a new organization. And sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that, hey, it's not just about going through the different steps, but actually enjoying every moment along the way. And then I've, I've found myself at times losing a particular passion or particular spark because I'm just going through the, through the different motions instead of just enjoying the whole process. So that's what really um, excited me about today's topic. Excellent. Yeah, and that, that's very true. Uh, Edward, how about you share a little bit? Peace, peace. Uh, great to see both of you. Uh, we had such a great conversation last time we spoke, so I'm really excited about about today's topic. Um, so, you, you know, you sent out a list of you know things we want to talk about for the year, and certain uh, things just popped off the off the chart for me. And today's topic was one of them. Um, it was really just in the in the title itself, the the spark, the word spark. Just you know, it just excites me. Um, and you know, when you peel yourself back, you know, and start to really learn to value yourself and that's when you're finding out who you really are um, and that who you really are is what uh, should be leading you every day it ma making you passionate making you driven you know finding that who finding that little glimmer inside and that's that who that you take forward and you know go into uh, Erica's um, saying about how you can lose that in life don't let never let anything get in front of that passion that because that's the who is who you are so let's let's talk about that spark yeah Absolutely. The who, the who you are piece of it. So, you know what, Let, let's, let's kind of start off there. You know, in today's world, as I, as I said in the opening, there, there are challenges coming at you from every direction. I mean, every day there's always something new, whether it's in the news or the political cycle or this or that, or you know, just to, whatever career path you're on, whatever challenges you have associated with that. Uh, but that really comes down to what I deem the certainties and uncertainties in life because that's really where it's coming from, right? So we strive to have, obviously, for comfort, as much certainty as we possibly can in our lives. You know, we want to have it be simple and something we can depend on, et cetera, et cetera. However, <laughs> the world <laughs> feels totally differently about that. And, uh, you know, it, it brings a lot of uncertainty. So this is where you get that conflict and that discomfort within yourself. So let's first talk a little bit about what are some of the ways, what are some of the things that you have done, and Edward, I'll, I'll let you share first, to really try to find that balance and walk that line between the certainty that you want in life, because it does bring us comfort, and the true realities of life, and that's the uncertainty that, that happens. Well, I think, you know, when you're navigating life's uncertainties, you have to figure out where you are in life, and, and that means how you define life. Um, are you are you a part of your environment? Are you uh, separate from it? Because um, that's going to determine how you perceive it and receive it. Um, so I like how that ties into our topic of finding who you are, because you know if you find yourself a part of your environment, um, you may you know receive um, these changes that are going to come as an attack on you as uh, yourself and your person. But if you understand who you really are you know that these things are going to come and they're going to go and you're you know just in the background observing you know these things and don't have to take them personally um take them as the opportunities that they are and and learn how to walk through them 
um, in, in grace and in love. And you're, um, that's the best way to manage. And that's how I manage mine on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. You know, that's, that's a good point. So, but if someone comes to you, for example, and they say, you know, I'm really struggling, what advice do you hand off to them? What would, because obviously that's what's working for you. How would you frame that to, to, for someone who's like really struggling to get their head around that? I always tell people to start with just calming their mind, find calm, find calm. It, you know, it, the, the topic is about, you know, finding purpose in the chaos. You, you have to figure out ways. I always start with mindfulness and sometimes that's really hard for people to get their heads around, but I tell them simply, it, all that means is quiet, quiet, find ways, find spaces, turn the radio off, turn the TV off, you know, spend longer times in the shower, you know, find ways um, to practice just getting away and unplugging. Um, and that's how you, uh, I tell everyone to start, you know, dealing with that chaos and those uncertainties, because when you have that space, there you can actually think, but when you're in the world, when thinking is very hard. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Erica, what about you? What What's your take on trying to just find a balance between, you know, the certainty we want because it's comfortable and the, the reality of the uncertainties of life? I agree with him. Uh, really just trying to calm yourself. Uh, one of the things that I've had to remind myself recently is that not everybody's going to be happy that you're so sparky right? <laughs> that you have thus yes. far. Yes. And yes, so yes, yes, yes. when you find yourself um, kind of questioning or or feeling a little bit sluggish, uh, more sluggish than your usual sparky self, a part of what you might need to do is to look around and see what the environment is and what's changed about your environment that's causing the drain or causing mm-hmm. you, you to feel that the energy is really blowing away from you and not in a a positive way. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's one of the things that I personally have had to kind of reassess myself, uh, my surroundings. And if there is something or someone I've allowed into my space that has uh, impacted me in such a way that I don't feel my normal sparky self, So a part of igniting or keeping, you know, your sparkiness, I think, is to to stop when when you, and evaluate your surroundings when you feel like something within you has changed. Because maybe it's your spirit telling you or warning you about something that's for your good. And I think when mm. we uh, too many times we ignore ignore that feeling inside. Maybe we try to just stay busy or focus on something else or, but it's all, but your spirit is telling you to be alert. And um, I think by ignoring that, lots of times we negatively impact our own mental health because we're not listening to ourselves. So part of igniting our spark and maintaining that spark really is to listen to what's inside. Hmm. Because lots of times we're telling ourselves, we're giving ourselves warnings and a part of ourselves just doesn't want to listen. Yeah, very true. So uh, self-talk is, is a very important piece of it. And, and, and what that dialogue is really, really matters as to what you're telling yourself. And because it becomes habitual to you, you know, when you're, if you're telling yourself that this is a negative thing or this is a negative space, that starts to erode and eat away at, as you said, your spark. Right. Mm-hmm. So figuring out maybe what it is that that self-talk is and it's that little person on your shoulder that's, you know, whispering in your ear all day, uh, mm-hmm. really getting a grip on that, because that could really be what, what the challenge is. So sometimes it's outside things, but what's really going in is your own perception of those things and then how you then feed it to yourself. So that's also a very important piece of it that you have to watch out for. Uh, one of the things I want to share talking about just that trying to manage and maintain and, and stay on that line of certainty versus uncertainty is screen time, right? I mean, we have so much distraction. We're inundated with all of this information that's just at our fingertips, phones and tablets and computers and the television and everything else. So we spend so much time 
looking at screens and taking in all this data that has to have an impact on you, you know, and, and just realizing really truly finally going, you know what, enough is enough. And as Sean was saying a minute ago, step away from that. Right. I mean, you find a place of true peace where you're, you're not staring at a screen or that those types of eat. It is interesting. I was just reading um, a, a thing and this guy was talking about how to find kind of your center and especially when you start your days right because he's talking about focus and dopamine you know which is one of the things that comes up quite a bit about screen time and oh i got likes you know you have all these different stimuli um and i was really surprised that he said one of the things on the list not to start with in the morning is even music and he said and i was just like wow that's interesting because that was surprising because a lot of people think music is a good thing, which I'm not saying it isn't, but you know, you would think, wow. He says, so that's just truly 100% instrumental or classical type music that it's not something to start with in the morning. He says, because if it has lyrics, those lyrics resonate with you and that either distracts or it impacts your thought process. And I was like, I never thought about it that way, but that was very fascinating. So again, just, trying to find that quiet time, true quiet time, where you can be away from screens, even music, um, maybe, and, and, and just be with self, I think really, really matters quite a bit. I was um, reading an article actually yesterday, and they were talking about the way you speak to your children when they wake up before they go to school, and also when it's time for them to go to bed, it seeps into them. So not as much as just uplifting them about, oh, you're so great, yada, yada, yada. But if you're already fussing in the morning and then they hop out the car and you're like, have a great day. But y'all done had fits right before they got in the car. Well, that's not a, the greatest way to send off <laughs> the other person. Or when it's time to put them down to sleep, y'all are struggling and fighting rather than maybe saying your prayers at night or, or doing something positive and having some positive words. Then... If your kids go to sleep with that being the last thing they hear from you, from you. Um, and, but you tell them to have great dreams, sleep well. Well, y'all just struggled. <laughs> y'all had a tussle before you put them to bed. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a very interesting concept. I've never just stopped to think about, think about that. But I think lots of yeah. times we as parents, we're just doing the routine. You're, you're late again. You forgot the homework. You're da, da, da. You always do this. So you didn't pick up the table. You didn't wipe up the table. You didn't take the dog out. I had to take your dog out. You know, what about the trash? You should have done that last night. Now we're late. And, and then we have, you know, we say, have a great day at school. But right. <laughs> we have tussled right. for about an hour. You know, as a as a dad, that's one of the things that I that I love and that I'm very passionate about. You know, and you know, I got a three year old at home and just have a little one now. Um and that's one thing I'm very cognizant of is making sure that, you know, even from the moment he opens his eyes and even how I wake him up, you know, not jarring him awake, you know, being very, you know, calming, making sure the first thing he hears is, hey, good morning. We're having a good day. You slept really well and make sure he's affirmed from the moment he wakes up because I know that's going to set the tone for him for the whole day. When I don't do that, he gets to school very grumpy. When I do that, he, he um, is hugging and kissing the teachers. So with, with kids, it's very easy to see that cause and effect. But in uh, grownups, you know, it's very hard for them to connect that dot and understand that the very first thing you say in the morning to yourself is going to set the tone for your whole day. We're going to snowball from that first thing. So that very first thing, you got a, a window of about, you know, five, 17 minutes and everything that goes on in that window is going to snowball through the day. So if it's negative, it's, oh my God, he left the toilet seat up. Why are we out of tissue? Um, oh, let me check my phone. Oh, I'm late for work. That's, you're gonna have that spirit all day. So I, I, you know, that's my time for affirmation. I, I set the tone for what my day is gonna be. I know it's gonna be a good day. I told her right all the time, I haven't had a bad day and I, I, can't, I can't count because I said it in the morning, it's, it's our job. It's our right and it's our special blessing. And that's how we get to start the day and we get to start our day in control, in a positive mindset, in a loving mindset. And then, you know, our spark can fly. Yeah. Could not agree more. It's so funny you bring that up, Edward, because I had a coworker for years and they would come in the office and there would just be this 
you know, literally dark cloud kind of thing. And they would, go, if you said good morning to them, they would always correct you right away and just say morning. They would, they, they would speak to people, you know, out of courtesy, but it was always morning. It wasn't good morning. You know, which makes it so that was just their attitude that they brought to the table. So it's so interesting how something that simple, as you said, sets the tone, sets the pace, creates the environment uh, of just the, the negativity and, and how that brings everybody down. Right. So very, very important points. The other piece of that I want to talk about is being conflict averse. And I think that's another part of it, too, that happens because there's another piece talking about trying to find that balance and talk about communication is, is another part of that too uh, we are in a society and you can say it's being politically correct or many many other things that are woven into it but conflict or uh, being conflict averse or avoiding it but this goes back to what i want to say about not going to bed angry right and i think that also plays a big, big role in how well you sleep, what your mindset is like, what your energy levels are like. I mean, just so much is driven by that. However, because of the po political things and the world we live in and yada, 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 we don't want to go at that conflict, whatever it may be, that has us upset or angry. So we would much rather keep it inside and take it to bed versus going head to head with it. And what are your thoughts about that? And what experience do you have? Or how have you guys managed your way through those types of situations? Well, what, what I would say is there's, there's two definitions of conflict averse, um, you know, two schools of thought, you know, one is, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to shy away from that effect because I, I don't want to deal with, you know, what comes with the conflict or addressing the conflict um and you know i think people would 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 uh, far less go down that pathway of being uh, oh i don't want to talk about something or deal with something um from a space of you know i don't want to you know engage i don't want to hurt someone's feelings or i don't even i don't want the drama that's going to come with that but you know i think we learn that you know you get to choose you get to you know give yourself permission to just let go of things you don't even have to have a conflict when you're dealing with you know you know any type of duality or any type of contrast you know i'm waiting for someone to forgive me i'm waiting for someone to engage with me on this topic that i'm upset with before i go to bed i know i can i can just let that go you know i'm empowered in such a way you know i think we often get tied in you know, how we have to assign blame to people and assign hurt because we assign so much hurt to ourselves that we don't understand that we can simply just let it go. Okay. I don't have to, you know, what my mama said, you know, don't go to bed angry. Well, then, then sir, ma'am, don't go to bed angry. You don't have to wait for them to let you <laughs> go to bed angry. Just, just decide I'm going to go to bed angry. Hey, whatever it was, this day is done. I've done my task. Tomorrow's a new day and this has no effect on it because every new day is just that a new day not tied to the past or the future so you can let it go I, i'm a pretty firm believer that most of the time people know what they're doing uh i, I know they're mental health specialists like you who would say sometimes they don't <laughs> <laughs> but i operate with people from a vantage point that they know what they're doing so I don't have a whole bunch of back and forth with people if they do something that I find hurtful or not classy. I don't have a lot of time going back and forth with folks on it. Right. Um, it's something simple like, you know, maybe uh, I can think of some. I rarely get just irritated over little things. But so small things I'll, I'll mention and kind of just move on. Uh, but as far as anything that would have me so mad, I'm going to bed or it's nighttime and I'm angry over, I really, I don't really do a whole bunch of back and forth on it because I believe that most people know what they're doing and they do it on purpose. They say it on purpose and they've made a decision 
to do certain things. And when they made the decision to do it, either they thought about me or thought about me and I just didn't matter. Mm, So that's that's how I treat that person. So I'm not going to do a lot of go back and forth with somebody over something that they made a decision to do. And when they make that decision to do it, then they get to experience the consequences of that. Well, you know, um, Esther that's Hicks would say- not, And sometimes that's just not me engaging at all, but mm-hmm. they check that. Because yeah. I'm not gonna sit in like a fool just because somebody wants to do the fool. I, mm-hmm. I, I truly believe most people know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, you know, and even, you know, in contrast to that, you know, not only do they know what they're doing, but, you know, Esther Hicks would say, you know, you guys that, you know, you can both be right. Yeah. You, you can both be right. Like, you're, if, I, if I receive, you know, it, it comes out of your mouth wrong and snarky and nasty, um, in your mind, you are right. And it's, I don't have to prove to you that you're wrong. No, hey, you can be right. You felt that you had to say that. I'm also going to say that I'm right, and I don't have to receive that, you know. So you know, we can have that. Do I and respect respect that place and not, you know, simply spend all of our time mashing things together that don't need to be associated at all. Right. Yeah. And sometimes people don't even say mean uh, things in a mean way or a snarky way. It's just you just disagree. And so there's no need to be doing a whole bunch of back and forth. And there's just a disagreement. You don't have to internalize every disagreement as a reflection of, you know, you or them or it just, I hate to use it, but it just sometimes is what it is. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So Erica, I like what you talked about of their, about their purpose. You know, what is their purpose or reasoning behind whatever it is that they're doing and how they're treating you? And that's a perfect segue to what we want to talk about next. And this is really what we're talking about identifying what is your purpose in life? What are you passionate about? Uh, what do you truly value, right? Uh, because I think that is one of the best ways to start to move yourself forward. Because uh, as I said earlier, it gives you, I think, what more direction and more of a focus to, to, to focus in on. So you can start to deflect a lot of whatever else might be out there in the world that is distracting or trying to take you away from the things you want to focus in on. So with that said, I want to bring up a slide and share it and then we'll talk our way through this. So this is talking about finding your true aspirations. And it's based on a Japanese principle called Ikigai, and which is essentially uh, translated loosely to, you know, find your purpose, find your life's purpose. So here's the, 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 the simplicity of this. It's simple when you look at how it's laid out, but it's actually a very difficult thing to truly do from the standpoint of boiling it down because it, we want to get these four categories together in a way where you have identified that one or two things in each category that then you can bring into your life. And then in the middle, that essentially brings you to your true aspirations or your purpose. So as I review this, we'll start at the top. What, are, what is it that you love to do? Uh, and as you, we, we've all heard that saying about if you do so, if you the work you do is something you love, then you never actually really work a day in your life. And to a degree, that's true because you're, you're, you're working at something that, that you love to do. Uh, what are you good at doing? Because the fact that you love it, for example, I like to ski. I suck at skiing. <laughs> But I, I, I do enjoy when I go and try to fall down the mountain, right? Uh, so probably not the right thing to put on the list because, yes, I love it, but no, I'm not good at it. So that that can't stay. Uh, the other one on the right is what does the world need? And let's be specific about the definition of world because now we're talking about the world is your definition of world. It could be your family circle. It could be a little larger than that. It could be your community. It could literally be the entire world. So figuring out what you value from the standpoint of what does your world need and you define what your world looks like. So what is that thing? Mm -hmm. And then the final piece is what can you be rewarded 
for doing. Rewarded is obviously the compensation or uh, you call it monetary. It doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. Sometimes it can just be gratitude and appreciation. But again, that's a definition you make for yourself. So finding something that fits all four of those categories will bring you to a point of finding your true aspirations. So that said, uh, Edward, I'll come to you first. What are some of your thoughts about this and, and how that plays into your life? Um, I'm trying to pull my, my screen back up here. <laughs> but um, I really like the, the part where you, you know, you know, finding what you, um, what, what your thing is. And, you know, Steve Harvey puts it in a way of, you know, you know what do you do the best? Like, what, what, what are you the best at? With, with the least amount of resources what what is your what is your you know what is your organic thing right um and, and when you can when you can find that um you're able to find you know what what you're on this earth for what you're here to be um, and it but it ties back to you know being able to quiet yourself because you can't find out who you are when everybody is giving you feedback all day on how you should feel um, you know, it, if you look at, you know, television programming, you know, in, in an hour of television show, you're only getting you know, 11 minutes of content and everything else is all propaganda and built to, uh, in, to influence you, um, you know, from the songs that they're playing in the, in the commercials to the wordplay, to the coloring, um, to the sounds that they're using, the, the harmonic frequencies that they use to control your body, um, with all that going on. You don't know, you know, you know, even what sex you are now. That's how distracted kids are. They're so distracted at this point in life that um, they don't know their sexuality, uh, whether their what their sex is, what that means to have a sex, you know, all of that. And that's all due to being so distracted that you weren't able to establish certain key things about yourself as a human being in this space okay and when you when you say in that space that goes to the other part of the of the ikigai talking about your world that space is, is your world and your world can be as broad or as uh or as tight uh, as you want it to be but you have to play all those roles in, in that you know i'm a big pan-africanist and i you know big into what's going on you know on our content what that means from a cultural sense knowing your tribal uh histories and things like that but just imagine, you know, before you can even get to those big, lovely things that you really want to get into that are so important to life, you can't get even off the bus, get started in life knowing who you are. And it's all due to distraction. So, you know, we have to quiet everything out so that you can find, you know, that little bell that's tinkling in the back of your mind, you know, that light in the darkness, you know, that thing that makes you shine. You know, um, you know, my mother's, I know what it is. She has a little wink that, that she does when she thinks she's cute, right? She does a little, little wink, you know, and when she's in that mode, I know that she is doing her thing. Usually for her, it's behind the piano. She thinks she's hot stuff on that piano and she, she really is, you know, but that's her, that's her thing. That's her thing. Now, whether, you know, and whether she's being paid for it, whether she was invited, she'll just walk into a random church, uh, a random recording hall, you know, in a museum, wherever she is, she's going to play that instrument because that's her thing. You know, she doesn't have to get rewarded for it. She doesn't have to get uh, remunerated in any way because that is so much a part of her and that is her spark and that's what she provides to life. But she's in, we have to be able to get to a place where we can see that in ourselves. And when we see that in ourselves, then we can also see that in others. Yeah. Well, remember we were talking a bit about social media and our children. One of the things that I've noticed about kids nowadays, unlike kids when, when at least when I was a child, I'm maybe older than y'all, um, we used to figure out ways to make money, right? We'd figure out what our talents were, whether you were a paper boy, paper girl, or you had a lemonade stand, or you did haircuts, or you cut lawns. We figured out what the community needed, and then we figured out, can we? are we good at it? And then we earn money doing it. Whereas a lot of children now, it seems like they're not taking advantage of the opportunity because there is so much screen time now. 
And it does make me wonder, you know, how do they find what they're really good at besides video games or maybe getting clicks on social media or dancing to get attention? <laughs> you know, what are they are they taking time out to look at the community to see what the community, what their world needs, what they're good at and how they can actually make a contribution to the community while making income for themselves. It's a, it's a really, it really is a shift in making kids more consumers than actual inventors. Whereas that's what we were in the seventies and before that. Um, so as far as finding that purpose, I think for people of our generations, we can we are more in tune with that. But I am a bit concerned about the generations of our children and grandchildren, great grandchildren, because their world is a bit different. They they're not focusing on some of the same things that we focused on then. You know, how do you notice what your world needs? How do you create? I'd say and I um, from your creation, you know. I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And I'd say part of that is we've also become very aware, you know, in in today's age of how broken a lot of us are as people. And some in some of that brokenness, I think we've forgotten how to be able to guide that next generation into those feeling spaces uh, because it was it was just organic for us. You know, we had people, you know, showing us and living that, and it was part of our DNA as a people and as a culture. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a saying that, you know, hard times make you know strong people. You know, strong be, strong people make you know softer times, and soft times make soft people. Um, and you know, we've we've had it easy a little bit, and you know, we've kind of lost you know the way that oh we we have to show these guys, you know, how to find you know because we had a structure that, you know, led us in, in lack of a better term, you know, right. you know, we never, it wasn't an opportunity to not have a spark because everyone was pushing you for that because it was, it was necessary for the people to move, yeah. you know, for us to rise, everyone had to be on purpose and on task. Mm -hmm. And now that, you know, we've somewhat arriven for lack of a better term, you mm -hmm. know, um, it, we forgot that, oh, we, we, we still have to provide those guys with a spark and, you know, what their direction should be. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't assume that they're going to know that they're supposed to find something because right. everything's given to them. You know, they don't have to fight for anything. They, everything's given to them. If And if they don't like it here, they can go to an alternate universe, a plethora of them on a video game and yeah. live whatever life they want to be and not be affected in this one. And it really detracts from us as an organization, as a community, as a culture, when we allow our kids to get lost in, in those systems and not be a part of what's going on in the here and now. Yeah, because growing up, you'd have uh, friends, you know, people thought, I want to have a funeral home, I'm going to be a funeral dresser, or I'm going to have a barbershop or a beauty salon, or I'm going to have a restaurant, or I'm going to have a, you know, what are the whole number of car dealership? There were so many things that we knew we wanted to do, but now I, I'm not really seeing that as much um, from the other generations. Uh, yep. it's, they want to spend, right? And they want to earn uh, earn money. But I, the, as far as the inventions, as far as the entrepreneurial streak, uh, I don't. I, I'm concerned about them. I really am. I'm wondering if our world is making more spenders, right, and workers than inventors. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're on it. You're on it. Alan Watts talks about, um, you know, the, the, the Hindu people and, and the Japanese um, and the way, you know, their, their culture was set up and, um, you know, how you know, you learned your trade. They could, they could make cabinetry so beautiful. They didn't have to, you know, no measurements and everything was immense and imperfect. And they did that for thousands of years. But with industrialization, you know, dad now goes off to work, you know, you know, whereas son and dad would work together. Can you imagine working alongside your dad doing the same thing every day from, from the day you're two years old versus the day that you're 21? There's a big difference. And, and, and we've lost that. That, you know, now mom and dad, they're, they're going to do this thing called work. 
we don't know what that is, but they come back with money. We don't even know what that is. And so we're, we, we don't see, we, we all saw the work. We saw our grandparents and our parents actually working in what they were doing. And we, we were part of that, you know, while now they're out of the home, mom and dad are out of the home and, you know, all they're getting inundated with now is all the things that you can get with money. Yeah. You know, all you can get, but don't have an association to the how that goes into the instate of money. So I can spend, I can spend, but the how to get it is totally lost. Yeah. I, I remember like cousins, male cousins and um, grandfathers, literally like you could go over to somebody's papa's house and there'd be like pieces of something that might be able to be put together. And then over time, they build a whole car, you know, mm -hmm. with their grandfathers. And you build like, you build that. But different, yeah, grants and people, guys be just in the garage with their papas, and then they'd be building cars. Like grandpa, they would teach them how to literally go hunting and they'd come back and they'd be making sausage. And sadly want to explain the sausage making process to the women <laughs> now. But they, you know, you people learn things from their grandparents, like you said, their dads. They they learn. How to how to build things, how to create things. Um, I don't. Yeah. I, I hope hopefully kids are doing that today. I just don't see it as much. I, I don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be for sure. And then the the opposite side of that coin, which is also disturbing, is I was just reading an article and they were talking about the average age now that kids move out of their parents' home mm -hmm. is twenty nine years old. Oh wow. And, well, they yeah. should be rich. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you think about that and, you know, and and then so there's there's two sides to that coin. That's part of the child's responsibility. And as you said, they're disconnected. They're not really out finding their purpose and pushing themselves forward and getting out into the world and, and doing what they should do. But also a lot of that is on the parent for enabling and accepting some of that behavior too, right? So that goes up to upbringing and childhood. There's one lady that they specifically interviewed as part of this. Yeah, my son's still at home. He's 28 or 29, yada, yada, yada. And um, I pay for his lifestyle. So it's like, well, you're making it too comfortable for him. He has a BMW. He has this, he has that. It's like, why would you leave home, right? So that, that I think, so you have to look at both sides of that coin and say, yes, there is a lot of it that is on the child, but you also have to be very cautious as the parent as to how much we provide and how much we enable those types of behaviors to. I think that's, that's another big piece of it. I said, unless it's some type of cultural change, um, because, you know, some, certain cultures, they, they really want their daughters to try to stay at home a little bit longer, things like that. Unless it's something cultural, um, you know, you also have to think, are you really setting your sons up for success in the mating market? <laughs> you know, it's like, eventually you might want some rigging if you're really setting them up for success. Um, yeah, because yeah, they have to, you know, be able to be, re be ready to take on a leadership role for their own households. You know, so yeah. you can't you be know. paying for everything for a, a much older son because... He has to be able to manage and lead himself so he can lead a family. That's that's my thought. Maybe that's just not everybody else. But um, yeah, that's my, that's my yeah. thought about older signs. It's different if somebody, I think you're right on. somebody you know, needs to, lost a job or they, there's some transition there for a period of time. But for it to be an all the time thing, I don't know. Y'all are guys. What do you think? Y'all know guys. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll speak for I'll speak for for guyhood. Um, you know, you know, right right now, if you look on in the social media spaces, we're in this you know guy versus girl back and forth drama, very heavy, and it, it, to the point that it's gotten quite disturbing to me. Um, you know, you know, the girls are saying the, the guys are broken. The guys are saying the girls are broken, um, and not understanding that we're we're both broken. Now we can throw blame at each other, and it will very much stick. You know, we can throw it across the hall. It, it will it will very much stick. Um, but that does not help uh, us move move forward. 
Um, and the science, you know, you know, shows that, you know, it's, it's coming from, you know, the prominent single mother house home um, is where all of this is stemming from. You can't have a manly man that knows how to be a man and do the tasks of a man, the mindset of a man, the workability of a man, the focus of a man, all those things that equal to the leadership of a man coming from a single parent household and definitely not one that's been generationally single mother, single mother, single mother households because it distorts, you know, a, a, a man's view of life. I, I talked to my mother, we're actually writing a book right now about, you know, that dynamic mother to son examining that topic. But, you know, I tell her, you know, there's some things that I know you tried, but you just can't be a, be a man, you know, because men need to hear from men. You know, I pride myself that my sons get to hear me direct them from, you know, even just how to pull up a diaper, how to, how to potty, how to dress themselves, you know, and so many men out here have not heard that mm -hmm. and have not heard anything from a man mm -hmm. regarding a thing. You know, my sons get the littlest things. Pull up your pants like this, son, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Yeah, men, because men, men talk and interact on a man basis. Mm -hmm. Women don't know that basis. There's a certain way you talk, a certain way you respect, a certain way you stand, a certain way to look, a certain way you posture, a certain way you inflect your words. Um, mm -hmm. These are men, because men speak in, you know, we're gruff. We know we, we speak, and a woman can't, <laughs> can you imagine a, a, a mom trying to teach her son, now when that man comes to the room, you got to size him up, make sure, you know, Mm -hmm. You know, look look at look at his body language. He, you know, you know, kind of how to. A, a, a mom can't do that. That's man stuff. And so, all the men that are broken out here, you know, from even from moms that have tried their best, there is a disconnect in how we can how we can just be men. Um, and that that's the huge thing. That's the driving factor behind all of this, yeah. in in my opinion. Yeah. So um, we can all grow but we have to f realize how broken we are and get back on the wheel and we can grow, you know, together. We, mm -hmm. we you know, we broke together. We have to build uh, together or there's no, or, or there's no way up and there's no hope. Yep. But in my opinion, that is the hope for, for our society because we're, we're seeing that and, and everyone is going through a healing process. We have to learn how to pull, pull up, pull our, put our triggers back down, put the guns up, Let's stop blazing, you know, and, and we can move forward, but we can't move forward if we're shooting each other uh, at the same time. We should be, you know, patching each other's wounds, uh, you know, <laughs> salving and, and, and reconnecting those broken bonds and finding those pieces that are still there that, you know, you can just latch on to one in the one, you know, glue things back together, you know, and um, we can we can make ourselves whole again. Yep. Yeah. So, so agree with you on that. And that this, this is, this, that's a topic for a whole another podcast all by itself. Oh, yes. I, oh, yes. I do want to close this out and move on to the next session because I think there's a piece of what you're saying that, what, that's also critical. And that has to do with just the feminine and masculine energies and how mm -hmm. those things have, for whatever reasons, kind of flipped themselves between the genders as well. And, you know, obviously women have much more power, they have much more uh, stronger careers, they're more independent than they have been in generations past, right? Uh, Erica, you talked about that with, I think, your mother, your grandmother, and how you know she was a strong woman, but from a business standpoint, she wasn't necessarily let into that space, you know, those kinds of things. Well, that shifted over, over time. So that brings for a woman more of a masculine energy in today's world, right? And then going back to what Edward is saying about a man who's generationally, you know, single parent home, that gives that man more of a feminine energy, right? Yeah. So now you yeah. have yeah. this conflict that's going on between <laughs> the two. Brian, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I'll, I'll, re I'll say that sometimes. I said, man, I, that response I just had to something, that was such a single Black woman response, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'll, I'll catch myself like, you know that I call my mom. Man, I was I was a single black woman today. <laughs> I was, that was a, a bitter black woman response I just had there. You know, and we can laugh about that now because we've been able to uncover that with each other. Like, you know, I learned how to respond to situations by mimicking the way my mother 
response, you know, to a situation. And, and when women meet guys that have that, that tendency, it's like, and I say, hey, you know, it's, they're not wrong. They're just responding in the way that they learned how to respond, you know? So, you know, we can, we can help each other. Like, nah, there's a better way to do that. But don't, don't kill each other over it. Just say, hey, he learned that way. This guy learned that way. You know, mm-hmm. all of us are works in progress. But if we can learn to open up and share with each other, we can really see that, you know, and that's where our growth is. That's where our spark is. Because that's <laughs> us. We're, we're underneath that. Because before I was, you know, learned these things from my mother, I was someone. I was something. So I don't even have to hold on to that. And now that we've, we've uncovered it, I can put that to the side and say, oh, no, that's, that's single black woman, Sean, right there. That's, that's, that's not a real deal. I, can, I don't need to wear that hat anymore um, because I'm here. I'm me. This is me. I'm in the bow tie that I wear to work every day. Yeah. That's my spark. That's, just- that's my shine. That's me. And that, that's the totem that I wear every day to symbolize this is, this is the me. Everything yep. else is floating around me. Everything is in, that, that I have to, you know, challenge with and contest with in life, all those conflicts, that, all that's just contrast because I'm me in the middle. I'm mm-hmm. in the middle here and I can choose to pull in and reject what I don't want in there. Yep. And I continue to sign. And, that, you know, it's a perfect segue to the next thing we want to talk about, too, because what we want to talk about next is actually overcoming those that doubt, that self-doubt, that, mm-hmm. those fears. And that's really what it's all rooted in is you, as you talked about earlier, Edward, digging back to find mm-hmm. out who you truly are, right? That reflective piece, that getting everything else out of the way, uh, finding some calm and some quiet and all of that so mm-hmm. that you can figure out who you are. Because when, you, when you're not in that space, you do have all this doubt. You have all these fears because you don't even understand you. So how do you expect the rest of the world or your spouse or your, girl, oh, your, your boss, whoever else, to be able to relate to you when you haven't even figured that piece of it out as well, right? So you have this uh, situation going where you're trying to navigate your way through a world where you yourself are full of doubt and you're full of fears because you don't have a good, strong self-identity. So that's the, that's the next thing I want to talk about. So, Erica, I'll come to you. From a self-identity standpoint, what is it that you have done or what you've seen to, to really uh, give yourself that pedestal, I guess, where you feel comfortable, you stand tall, mm-hmm. this is who I am, this is what I believe in, and you stand by that? Yeah. Really being good to people being kind and respectful to people and being myself, not feeling that I have to be something or someone else to um, make a group like me and really growing enough to know that not everything or everybody is my cup of tea and I'm not necessarily everybody else's cup of tea. And it's okay because there's there's a lot of cups out there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> nice. Really just learn just to be my authentic self. And if somebody doesn't uh, like it or like me and I've been true to myself, it, it doesn't matter. And really accepting that and then encouraging other people to feel the same way about themselves with that type of confidence and love for themselves. You know, I don't have to like any particular person. That don't mean anything's wrong with them. Um it's just not may not be my cup of tea and vice versa. So really encouraging other people to take that same approach. Um, the sad thing is a lot of people hear things in their childhood and everybody always has the voices of their parents or grandparents or that silence from parents or grandparents. And they're operating from, from that. So that when I say I don't do a whole bunch of back and forth with people, because if I did, I'm not dealing with the person in front of me. I'm dealing with the voices in their head that they heard decades before they even met me. And I can't mm. box with those. So I'm not going to waste my time doing it. So yeah. really, I just have learned that I'm just going to be myself and try to improve every day. Do I mess up every day? Yep. Oh. <laughs> but I try to be better and learn how I could have approached certain situations differently 
And I encourage other people to do the same thing and not beat themselves up or put themselves down because they made a mistake or they could have turned left and when they should have gone, they turned left and they should have gone right or no, everybody's human. I was talking to a friend um, last night on the phone. I was like, you know, I wonder if when God created the universe, was he just like bored when he created people? Like, why do you say make people? And he made them. He's like, oh, that's good. He's God. He literally could have made people and made them perfect. You know, like, was he just bored? You know how we were learning about Greek gods growing up and how they watched the mortals move around for their entertainment. I'm like, was God just bored? bored like he was just out there in the vastness like i really want to just shake it up you know and i'm gonna make something <laughs> that's good not perfect but good because i want to be entertained you know well that's what we're dealing with we're dealing with people that are good not perfect people and for me to be beating up somebody else when they're just as good as me i'm not if this is a if this is proper in grammar i'm not more perfect than them they're not more we're we're good so for mm. me to beat up somebody else for being good just good not perfect and for them to do the same thing to me well they're trying to take the role of what god a role that god already has right because god created us and he made us to be good not perfect That's <laughs> you're, you're all over it. You're, you're all over it. And that's really so why. Saying, I, I the Bible it. says, um, be something like be perfect, like I'm perfect. We're like, we're striving to be. But when we were created, according to God, was like, this is good. This is good. It's good enough to keep God interested. <laughs> there you go. There you, there you go. I, I love the I love the word trust because I, I love and respect words, you know, and I think that, that was personal. He didn't say, you know, I made them. Oh, man, and this is perfect. But see, you know, our perception, we we think perfect and good are synonymous. They mean the same thing. They don't. He said good because good gives room. Good gives duality. Good gives contrast. Because that way you can't have a good and so quote unquote evil. If it was perfect, there could be, you know, there would be nothing else. There would be nothing to go back and forth with. The earth literally would not move if God said, and this is perfect. You know, that's end game. You know, the flowers don't die and come back the next day because perfect flowers would live what? Forever. Yeah. Right. But we, we want that duality. We want that cycle. That's why he said, and, and they're good. You know, uh, Eric, you might not know this, but, you know, I, I coined myself a, a healthpreneur and, you know, mm -hmm. solistic <laughs> healer. Um, but I, I love, you know, being able to, you know, talk to people and really break down and get to um, helping them find the, the who that they are and finding that, that real you. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you look at self-doubt and fear uh, and depression and anxiety, those are all manifestations, you know, of something, you know. And when you're helping them find the you, you have to help them see that, you know, that's not who you are. I'm depressed. No, no, no. You aren't depressed. You're exhibiting some e expressive behaviors, but the you inside of you is not depressed. This is a manifestation of something. And usually it's because, you know, it's the words, words, it's the words they're telling themselves. What are you telling yourself? Why are you telling yourself you hate yourself? Why are you telling yourself you're not worthy? Where's the shame coming from? Where's the doubt? Where's the fear? Because, you know, at, in the beginning of every morning, you are not telling yourself you are worthy, you are perfect, you are precious, you are loved, you are source energy, you are soul, you are beautiful, you are divinity. And when you don't do that, every, all the distractions around you have told you that you're nothing, you're, you're worthless, you should be used by men, you should, you should not own your self-worth, you shouldn't go try to get a new job, you, you sh shouldn't try to you know, own your own business. You shouldn't, and all you get is a bunch of you shouldn'ts and that, you know, manifests itself in our lives as depression, anxiety, stress, drinking disorder, you know, less drug usage, um, you know, just weird attachments to things we don't have to because we are not giving ourselves the words to, to better ourselves and love ourselves. So that's where that self-doubt and fear comes from. And for you to find yourself and find your spark, you have to find that blank canvas to write on, to tell yourself you know, on a daily basis, all day, every day, how lovely you are, 
how delicious your life is, how beautiful you are, and how much you love just waking up every morning. And you'll be less likely to go to work grumpy because you don't care about work anymore because you found out that you are not the person going to work. That's Sean going to work. But that's just Sean going to work. Sean's over here shining brilliantly, living and loving life and just enjoying the fact that the sun is out. You know, there's no doubt when you have that kind of love and passion flowing through you, you're shining, you're sparking, and people see that. You said earlier, Erica, about, you know, people don't have to like, you know, your spark. You know, I changed to wearing bow ties and being very dressed up and fancy for work. And I'm a, in a physical therapy field where you can just wear, you know, khakis and a polo. But I found my spark. And when I put my spark on, it caused a lot of rub. You know, people look at you funny. Who do you think you are? Why are you so dressed up? And I realized that that's not about me. Right. It's about each of them, mm -hmm. you know? And I kept wearing my spark and didn't let it, you know, didn't hide it under a bushel as the song goes. And now people are coming around from around the city. <laughs> hey, where's that guy with the bow tie? Mm -hmm. You know, it starts drawing in. And now our, our clinic is, you know, well known and renowned for that. And that's just from just being myself having my spark and letting it shine. And I challenge all of us, you know, find your spark. And when you do, let it shine every day, just shine. And everything w will be as it should be. No need for depression, no need for anxiety, because w when you're sparkling, you're ignited, you're off like a rocket ship in your purpose, in your passion, heading towards something great. Yeah. 100%, yeah. So I wanna ask this question because there's this, trend i guess out, out there right now uh when and people are calling it matching energy and this kind of goes back to what erica was saying a little while ago and i just want to get your thoughts do you feel that's a positive thing a negative thing or are you kind of neutral about this whole movement of you know this person has this kind of energy towards me so i'm going to give them that level of energy back whereas this individual has you know a much lower amount of energy so that's what they receive or do you feel like you should just, as, as Sean was just saying, you should just be you and whatever level of spark and energy you normally operate at versus trying to equalize, I guess, with those around you? What are, you, what are, you, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Um, I, I believe that you have your set of energy, but you have to be respectful of other people and their level of energy. So if you don't want to overwhelm people, <laughs> So, if, uh, I don't believe in matching nasty energy for nasty energy. That's that's a waste of time, right? That's just evil. By just no, but to maintain your positivity, retain maintain your dignity, um, carry yourself in a classy way, be fun, be yourself, authentic self. Um, but if somebody is not um, necessarily open. Uh, opening up their space to receive your energy, you have to be respectful of that other person because we don't know what that person is going through. We don't know what that person has the capacity to accept. So we have to be respectful of other people's space. We have to keep our energy in a respectful stance so that we're not in, invading someone else's personal boundaries. So you do, yeah. we do, we have to matching energy positively. If somebody smiles, of course you smell back. Somebody says, well, you smell, same thing. Or you say good morning and hopefully they'll say good morning back. But if they don't say good morning back, you don't go back and be like, well, I said good morning. Well, two, 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 two. No, <laughs> no, just stay yourself. Don't let other people dictate how your day is gonna go. So that's yeah that, you're you're right on you're right on um i when you're talking matching energy um and, you know like we always talk about the words that we're using are, are important you know to me your know, energy doesn't have a requirement you know it doesn't have a requirement meaning you know that that go back and forth kind of energy that erica was just referring to like oh they treated me this way <laughs> i'm gonna treat them the same way Oh, they treated me nice. I'll be nice to them. They treated me wrong. I'm gonna treat them equally as wrong. You know that that's that's a that's that's saying, you know, energy has a requirement. I'm required to match force with force. 
but it doesn't have a requirement. It has a responsibility. You know, I like the respect that Erica is using, but you know, I like the, the word responsibility because you have a responsibility to your energy. Yeah. Your energy is, is the only energy that matters, the only energy that you can control. So even if you feel someone has low energy, high energy, negative energy, you only stay within bounds of your energy and your responsibility is your energy and making sure that it abounds and it grows. And if there are things that are anti, that are forcing your energy, you know, the wrong direction, you be tentative to that and you harvest that. No, I can't, I can't be around you because you, you, you're sounding like the housewives over there. That's not my kind of energy. Um, you know, you're, you're very argumentative. That's not my kind of energy, you know, because, you know, energy, energy flows and it goes with your, you, with your attention. So if I want to keep my, you know, my energy pure, I can't have it tainted, but I don't have to put that on anybody. It's not anyone else's requirement. It's mine to maintain, to hold and to love and, you know, to harvest, but I don't have to bend it towards anyone or take it away from anyone, I can keep it nice and even, nice and neutral, because th th that's who I am, and that's my energy. But it's mine and not anyone else's. They can't, they can't affect mine either. And I think we forget that as well. So stop letting things uh, uh, take an affront to everything, because it really can't ma touch your energy unless you let it. Yeah, and, and when you when you are matching, if, if the whole attitude is matching somebody else's energy. I think people just leave themselves uh, to be a mark for someone because yes. anybody can manipulate you by giving you an indication that they have this type of energy. And then you're like, oh, this person has this type of energy. So I'm going to be like this type of energy. And then they can just go it on and run you all around the world until you have nothing else to give. And they'll take everything that you've that you've given or shared and go spend it on somebody else. If they're not doing it at the same time, one, they're running you around the world because you're so busy matching energy. You're not thinking for yourself. That's it. Sounds it's, draining, yeah. draining. Yeah. Energy vampires is what I call it. Those kind of things. Oh, I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Literally suck you dry. Right. So let's take, let's transition to the last thing we want to get into. And this is actually perfect because we're talking about energy and, Again, uh, as Elder was just saying, that's the thing you control. You can't control how others perceive it, take it, react to it, but you can't control your energy level. And, and the, the next, the last piece of the pie, when we talk about managing, getting through this chaos that we live in in our world today, and, and literally driving towards your purpose and, and your mission in life, uh, that requires action. So that's the last piece of, the, of the, this puzzle. Uh, and pushing yourself forward to take action. So a better use of your energy is that, I think, you know, is to, as you said, narrow it down to the direction you feel you need to go. And how about we start applying the energy in that direction and moving ourselves forward in, in that particular way? Because that's the best way, I think, to bring whatever it is you want to achieve to reality, right? Is focus, consistency, and where you actually take and, and, and place the, the energy that's there. But a lot of people struggle with that. Procrastination, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have time. Uh, I, I can't start now because it's not the right time. It, it needs to be the perfect moment, this, that. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? What do you share, Erica, when someone is kind of at that stagnant spot? They know kind of what they need to do. They even might have a, a fairly clear vision of where they want to get to and might even have a map of how to get there, but they won't take the first step, step out of the plane and start to free fall because or whatever, how do you push them out? And um, sometimes I wonder if they're afraid of success. Are they yes. afraid that they will actually succeed? And what does that mean when they do? Because People have it in it in them to be successful. And if they have a skill and they have a dream and it's been spoken into them, they can they can succeed. But if they're stuck and they're afraid to take the step, really what is holding them back? And I'm I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, so that's not um, my specialty. But it seems to me like if you have the talent and you have everything that you need to take that first step, 
why are you frozen? And the only other things I can think of is something, something talking to them, telling them that there's something on the other side that they don't, they're afraid to reach for. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a that's a really good that's a really good point um, about you know why people you know don't don't take off to where really where they want to be. Um, it and I say it goes back to words yet again, and I'm going to keep going back to that because that that is really my passion. It goes back to the words um, because when you learn in you know elementary you know English going into middle school you know you got things called action verbs, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 it's in the words, words are action. So, you know, those words that you're saying to yourself every day are, 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 are your action. That's your start point, saying affirming things to you. I, I, I am abundant, you know, I, I, I'm worthy, I'm wealthy. I had, to, I had to tell myself, hey, you're worth having some wealth. You know, I, I grew up with a lot of nothing and you get used to not having nothing and you forget that just because you had nothing, you you it's okay. You can have it, you know, yeah. but you can't get wealth if you don't think it's okay for you to have wealth. The, it, it, the money just doesn't pop in your account like, oh, here you go, because you don't think you deserve it. And if you don't think you can deserve it, you wouldn't even know what to do with it anyway. So you have the words that you say the words that you say are what starts the action. When you start with loving yourself and telling you what you can have and what you can do, then those words start painting the picture of your life and what you want it to be. You can start saying, oh, hey, that house, that neighborhood, that car, start talking to yourself, start talking to yourself, and, and, and you start gaining momentum. And that's where the action starts, you know, with, with a little gentle bump. You know, there's a saying that a tree falls in the way it leans, mm -hmm. it doesn't take much. What, what, what is a lean? That's a lean. Mm -hmm. We think that we need to have this huge Steve Harvey jump off of a cliff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Piece of action when really all we need is a lean. Mm -hmm. Lean towards the things you want. You, you, what you found your spark and what thing that makes you happy in life and what you want to do, just lean towards it. I want to public speak. Hey, I'm going to start leaning towards it. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I'm going to start leaning towards it. And the mm -hmm. momentum will pick up. But it starts with your words. Let your words spark you, drive you every day, every morning, leaning you towards. And that tree will eventually fall because all trees fall in the way they lean. And let that tree land you to your land of uh, dreams and destiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you were mentioning about fathers and, and sons, and, and then we just start talking about the, the words and how people can get stagnant and, and not make that next step. One of uh, another important role, why we should make sure that we encourage um, men to continue pouring words over their daughters is because those voices, daughters remember long after the fathers have, have mm -hmm. gone on. I remember my aunt, one day I was just over at her house and we were going through her closet and I was helping her with some things. And she was telling me about her dad and how her dad would take her to the store. This is back in the days of segregation. He would take her to such and such store on Galveston Island. And, you know, she would always, you know, be able to select a dress or maybe she, even though my grandmother could sew, maybe she'd go and have something created for her. And just the doting that he did. And even in her 50s, she wept at the at the thought of her father in those memories. Just, mm. just was teary-eyed over the amount of love that he showed her. And so when you're a dad and you're pouring words over your daughter, it, it matters to her when she grows up to be a woman because she'll always hear what you said. I remember that dad and my dad and I love reading books. And one day I, I read a book and I went and I told him about the book and he said, well, okay, who was the author? And, and that question he asked me reminded me of what you all were saying about words. And it, it's a matter of who was the author of what you have in your head. 
And that's Ooh, yeah. where dads come into play with daughters. Because when you all say, you know, you know, well, that's a very, that's a classy outfit you have on. Or, you know, that, that looks very nice. Or, you know, you carried, you did that presentation at Sunday school, gave that look. That was, that was really nice what you did. Or you're a very good speaker. Or you're, when you pour those words over your daughter as a man, as, as, her, as her father, that's what gives her that confidence of how to carry herself, what type of treatment to expect. When she sees you walk out and you're checking before you go to work and you, you check everybody's tires in the driveway because you, you know, you get up first probably and go to work first. So as a man, you're making sure everybody's set because you know the women in your house we're going to just run out and hop in the car. <laughs> we're just, we're just hop in the car. But as I mean, you're thinking about that, right? So when she gets ready to uh, be in a serious relationship, get married, then she's accustomed to, you know, if somebody's the man of the house, he's, he's keeping, no, she, yes, she should be keeping on her tires. Yes, she should. But she knows that here are some things that men do. And in yeah. order for us to really have daughters that understand that we have to be open. We have to step back and let their fathers take on those roles in doing that so that they know what the bar is. You know, when you get, when you're in a car, don't just be jumping out the car like you some dude. <laughs> no, but having a father or if somebody's father's passed away, their, their um, grandfather, their uncle, men teach that. And mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, we can't, uh, and, and I agree with you, a lot of the things we see online between women going back and forth, a lot of it is men really feel displaced from what I hear. They really feel yeah. displaced and yeah. wonder what other value do people think I have around here? What, you know, what people, do people think I don't have anything to contribute? Yeah, I'm that's a part of that, that mother, that's a part of that mother-son deficit that, that I was speaking to earlier. Um, it, you don't know what your place is, you know, because, uh, you know, a son to a mother, I mean, that's special. You are, you're a special thing. You're a special trophy and you're set over here and, you know, you, you just shine, you know, um, and, and so with you being placed off in the distance, up and away, you don't develop those things that you just alluded to, Erica. And that's what gets us into this place. And men don't know where they're supposed to be because they're used to being over here mom's trophy. You know, there's nothing wrong with the mom be making their son a trophy, but it doesn't give them the man skills that they need to go out there and check those tires, right? So, you know, and for me, it all goes back to um, self-love. You, you were talking about words that, you know, we're using to, dads were using to affirm their daughters. Um, a lot of us didn't get those words. A lot of us didn't get those words. And, you know, when Brian was asking about, you know, where we find our start point and we're talking about the words, that's our start point right there. I tell people, you know, because you never got the words told to you, you have to tell them to yourself. Yeah. No, no one's coming. <laughs> I love that yeah. adage. No one's coming. No one's yeah. coming to save you. You have to save yourself. And you do that by those dad words of affirmation that you did not get. You go ahead and step up and give them to yourself now. Those words mom didn't give her daughter, go ahead and give them to yourself now. All that wisdom that you've learned through life, all the ups and downs and heartache that you've cried about, you now know the words to say, right? Just let all that go. You've learned it. You had to learn the hard way, but you learned it. Now you know what to say to yourself to get you in the place to be the best self that you are and to live your purpose. But, you know, you have to be the one to give yourself the words because words manifest life. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. It's all the words we say to ourselves to manifest ourselves. Yep, I could not agree more. And going back to what Erica was saying about, you know, who's the author of what, what's in your head, that, that's, that's huge. The last thing I wanted to add on top of that is, I think you also have to develop, uh, I'm gonna call it a, a mute button, a mute from the standpoint of 
all of that outside stuff, right? Because there's so much that we're inundated with where, where, wherever it's coming from. Uh, but to, to take action, to stay on path, to stay on task, you, you, it's almost like blinders and a mute button that you need to develop that skill for yourself. And I think that's a, a key piece of it as well, uh, because there, everybody's going, you're going to do what? You know, sometimes that, what's that? What they call it monk mode, you know, where people kind of go, I'm going to go do this. And I'm just going to go do it. I'm not going to tell anybody, and, you know, because the moment you share, what's the first thing that's going to happen, right? What? That's not you, or you can't do that. You have experience. I mean, they, they are immediately just trying to tear apart. You know, you haven't even taken step one or two yet, right? So just being cognizant of that and maybe having that mute button so you can stay focused and you can stay on task will also, I think, help keep your mind clear so that you can stay away from that self-doubt uh eliminate a lot of those fears because most of those fears actually come from people around you in your world versus what's really inside of you as well it's just because of what they're telling and you know what the news says and you know what, what this and that and everything else that's going on so i think that's a, that's a valuable piece of it so i think that brings us to a point where final thoughts if there's eric i'll come to you first what would be the last things you'd like to share with someone about finding their purpose and once they've identified it going after it, pushing forward. Take time and sit still and really listen to yourself and what your passions are. Look at what you're good at doing. And I kind of agree with you. Keep it secret for a while until you polish it up. (laughs) Don't, Don't necessarily run out and share it just yet. Keep it secret till you polish it up and get some affirmations that what you're feeling and seeing and hearing is, is true. And then just take it from there. Yeah. Listen to what's going on inside. I, I think there's, um, there's power in words. There's also power in silence, you know, and, and navigating that continuum is, is a day, day-to-day task that, you know, we should stop expecting to get right and try to and perfect and understand that it's a continuum that we're going to slide left and right on each day. And when you have um, the dreams and of trying to make them reality, understanding you have the energy to bring those into fruition. Don't share that and let the air out of your balloon. You know, to prove to someone just to attempt to share with someone, to make association with someone, whatever your reasoning may be. The Bible says, no, go tell Peter, don't tell, the, don't tell John, don't tell anyone. Yeah. Once you got the word, you keep it to yourself because that word was for you. It's to inspire you. And the longer you hold on to it and keep a close hold to you, it's going to fuel you forward. But the minute you pop the seal, it's now on you to control. And why would you want someone else to control your word? So keep it to yourself and move forward and go with grace and let people watch you. Okay? Because yeah. the, the minute you tell them what's going on, now they have ammunition to tear at the things that you thought. Because you might not even know exactly what all it is yet. You just got a little piece of it. You know? And you know, if someone tears away your little piece before it's fully taken place, you've lost the whole vision. So, so hold on to that that gold nugget and go forward. Hold it like you're precious, <laughs> you know, like Lord of the Rings. It's my precious. <laughs> you know, take it forward with you. Don't share that because that's you. That's your you. And that was meant for you, not for anyone else. Now you can share when you get to the other side, and they can see your manifestation manifestation of the thing you're holding. But don't give them the thing you're holding in your hand. You hold that. And you let them see the holographic image of what you've done with it, but don't show them, don't show it. Keep it to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And my, my my final thoughts too, to kind of tag right on the end of that, uh, Edward, and that's talking about gratitude and appreciation, uh, and meaning that from the standpoint of that thing that you're holding, uh, make sure that it is. And again, this goes back to the reflective piece and and digging back to what you truly value. Make sure that whatever it is, is you're doing it for you, because if you are doing it for external values and validations and for someone else, 
the unfortunate thing is most times, and I'm not, maybe not always, but most times when you achieve it, it's an empty achievement, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you don't have the same appreciation, you don't have the same gratitude as mm-hmm. because it wasn't actually something you wanted to do for yourself. And especially mm-hmm. if you do it for outside validation of someone else, you achieve it and they kind of go, oh, that's nice. And it's just like, right? I mean, so it literally crushes you, right? Because you feel you put all this work and all this effort into it. So that's the last thing I want to say is just really have it be something that you truly value. And then as you work your way along that journey, uh, appreciate the journey. And then once you do achieve it, to the, the amount of appreciation and gratitude for self is, I think, a paramount thing to also have. Folks, this has been fantastic, and I've made a note here that we're going to come back and add an episode about men and women and feminine energy and masculine energy, because that's a whole conversation also <laughs> that we need to get back into. Again, I think so we can all go out and talk to people about, hey, what is your ikigai? What is your purpose in life? If you figured it out, what are you actually doing to accomplish and achieve it? So again, thank you guys. Until next time. Take care out there, take care of each other, and we'll see you soon. Bye now.